It's game over, Fed. You lose. And I'll prove it. All that and more on today's show. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. And in today's show, you're going to learn about a tight labor market and why that's bad for risk assets. So before we get into the show, I want to kind of lay the foundation so you have a really good understanding of how the Fed sees the global economy. So right now, the Fed perceives there is not a demand issue. They, they think demand is strong from consumers and that demand will continue to be strong going forward. Now, as you know, I don't agree with that view, but that is the Fed's view. They think the entire problem with the global economy right now is completely on the supply side. They acknowledge the supply chain issues and they, they say that this is completely a supply problem. And then when you, when you have continued demand and a problem with supply, you get inflation. So that's how the Fed sees the inflation issue right now. So when you have a tight labor market, what does that tend to do? Well, it tends to lead to higher wages and guess what? More demand. And if you have more demand and a supply problem, well, what's that gonna do to inflation? It's gonna cause it to go up. And so the Fed's going to react to that and make a huge policy mistake that's going to have a lot of consequences. Now, we started talking about this on Wednesday's show. And if you watched it, maybe you remember, what does a balance sheet taper do for risk assets? Well, initially it brings them down and it tends to cause them to go sideways for six to two, six months to two years. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to have a cataclysmic, you know, 50% decline in the markets. It, we very well could due to all the margin debt and all the risk taking that's been going on. But looking back, it means markets are going to get volatile and go sideways. So volatility will come back. Now, do you remember what it's also gonna to do to interest rates? It's gonna cause front end interest rates to rise and long end rates to fall, pretty much what we saw today. So when the payroll report came out this morning, the market had an initial reaction and then it had a completely change of tune to that. The initial reaction was, and we'll, and we'll get into the payroll report, was, aha, this was weaker than expected. The Fed isn't going to do anything. They're not going to go forth with their plans to taper as fast as they thought. And then the market had a big change of opinion. And I want to walk you through this because a tight labor market is, is great. There's really good reasons that it's a good thing for the economy, but not good at all when you understand what the Fed's going to do because that can actually lead to another recession. All right, let's pick this story up. And here you can see the Fed's taper, Fed seen on track for faster bond tapering despite the jobs numbers. This coming from Bloomberg. Federal Reserve policymakers are likely to follow through with a faster tapering of asset purchases despite mixed readings on the labor market recovery. The probability of an accelerated taper is going up. According to senior economists at Pickett Wealth Management, the Fed can't ignore the unemployment rate falling to a mere 4.2%. And that is an important piece of this. Payroll showed a weaker than expected increase, climbing just 210,000 last month after an upwardly revised 546,000 gain in October. So you can see here that there were a lot of jobs created in October and not so much now. But the jobless rate dropped to 4.2% as employment rose by more than a million in today's household survey. And that's one of the key parts to today's report that I want you to kind of focus on is that 4.2% number. So that is, that is low. It's not as low as the Fed would ideally like it, but the Fed's looking at the trend of this and saying, hey, at the current rate, we're going to be a sub 4% unemployment rate. And that means we need to massively back off our, our taper or our, our balance sheet and taper it down to zero, possibly even raise rates. So let's keep going with the story. Now, Fed Chair Jerome Powell told lawmakers this week that officials should consider speeding up the taper of bond buying at their upcoming meeting December 14th and 15th to wrap it up a few months earlier than initially planned. That would give the Federal Open Market Committee the option to raise rates earlier. Again, just what I said, if needed to cool off surge in inflation that he and colleagues warned would persist into 2022. A faster taper was backed by several Fed officials speaking on Thursday. So here we already know when we get the December 15th press conference, the only surprise now is if they don't increase the pace of the taper. Because when the Fed chief, when the head of the Fed says, this is what we're going to do, and he has you know his board members going along with it, it just means it's going to happen. And even if the board members aren't all on board, Usually what the Fed chair wants, the Fed chair gets. So keep in mind now, we already know there's an expectation that they're going to increase the pace of taper. Now let's keep going on with the story here. So this keeps the tapering train on track 
said the head of econ economics at uh, Renaissance Macro Research in New York. Following the release of the jobs report, they have opened the barn door too wide to pull back now. So he's referring to inflation as likely the tapering ends in March. And that is the belief right now that, that the Fed will stop its quantitative easing at the end of March. They are more reactive to the upside surprises in inflation than to the downside surprises in employment. Aha. And then we flip over to the Wall Street Journal. Declining jobless rate keeps the Fed on track to accelerate taper. Unemployment is falling faster than the Fed officials have anticipated. The economy is very strong and inflationary pressures are high. Key, key part. So they're looking at this and saying the economy is strong. Remember, they... This is a, they don't think there's a demand issue. They don't think demand is going away. They don't think there's a fiscal cliff. They think demand is going to remain strong and that's going to drive the economy. So let's keep going here. And it is therefore appropriate, in my view, to consider wrapping up the taper of our asset purchases perhaps a few months sooner. This is, you know, that's the quote from the head of the Fed himself a few months sooner. That puts the target at the end of March. That is the expectation now. The report Friday suggests the labor market is growing tighter, even if job gains weren't as strong as in previous reports. A separate survey used to calculate the unemployment rate showed a much larger expansion in jobs in November. So the household survey showed a, a, a million jobs versus the headline uh, uh, survey. So Mr. Powell said in recent rapid labor market improvement at congressional hearings this week when he said it would be appropriate to consider accelerating the reduction or taper of its asset purchases at the upcoming meeting. We all thought there would be significant increases in labor supply, and it hasn't happened, Mr. Powell said on Tuesday. It's an issue. What I'm talking, taking on board is that it's going to take longer to get the labor force participation back. We're not going back to the same economy. Now, what is the labor force participation rate? In case you're not familiar with it, it is they look at the total percentage of people that can work. And then it gets narrowed down to those who are working. So if you have a job, you're counted in the labor force participation rate. And if you're looking for a job, you're counted as participating in, in the labor market. If you're if you are age eligible to work and you're not participating, well, you're in the other part of the report. But what the Fed is looking for is the labor force participation rate to go up. And why does that make sense to them that it should be rising? Is because someone at home who is maybe disenfranchised about the labor market sees their friends and other people getting jobs and getting raises. And all of a sudden they get off the sofa and enter the labor market and go look for a job. And that drives the labor force participation rate up. Now, let's before we get into the unemployment data, let's go to Thursday's state unemployment claims because this is the beginning of where this is going. So let's check this out. All right, so what you have here is, whoops, went too far, is the unemployment insurance data for regular state programs. Initial claims were 222,000. This is consistent with a tight labor market. So I want you to understand here what's going on is you're not seeing a lot of employers laying people off. And so what is, why, is, why is that a tight labor market? Because if you're an employer, or if you've ever been an employer, why do you lay people off? Well, you lay them off because they're not doing their job, uh, because you don't need them, you don't have enough demand to keep them on the payrolls, or maybe you can trade up. You have maybe a, a bad employee you can get a good one for, or you, you've got a good employee that you can get a better one for, so you're willing to lay someone off to hire someone better. And, you're, and the unemployment benefit claim that you're paying isn't a big deal because you got the employee you wanted. So when employers are not laying people off, what does that tell you? The labor market is tight. And when the labor market's tight, well, we'll get to that in a second. All right, let's keep going here because what does this mean is that continued weeks of claim filed for total unemployment benefits are holding around 2.3 million. We have a little over 300,000 still on pandemic benefits and that will probably be going away. So we're seeing a normalized unemployment claims. Now let's look into today's data. What do we get? Non-farm pay report, as we already mentioned, 210,000. Uh, expectations were at 550,000. Let's look at the participation rate went up to 61.8. That's what the Fed wants this number to go up a whole lot more. But there's that key unemployment rate, 4.2. This is what the Fed's going to fixate on. The other thing they're going to look at is average hour, hourly earnings were up 0 0.3. Little missing expectations, but still up. And the year-over-year -year rate, uh, uh, rate of change was unchanged at 4.8%. And weekly hours were up 
a little bit to 34.8. So what does all of that mean? Well, here you see all employees. Well, we're 4 million short of where we need to be. But what the Fed thinks is this isn't a big deal. They're saying no problem because in a tight labor market, what will employers do? Well, they're going to raise wages. And what will that do to the participation rate? Well, let's take a look because here's the participation rate at 61.8. And the Fed believes that if wages start to go up, well, what starts to happen is the people participating in the workforce go up. And boy, that would be the best thing the Fed could see happen right now. They're not sure why it's staying so weak, but they believe it's going to go up. Now, what they don't know is when you invert the monetary base, which is the Fed's balance sheet, against the labor force participation rate, you start to see something very interesting happening here, which is bleeding into kind of the overall backdrop of what's going on is that financial conditions are tightening right now. And investors can't see that. They cannot see that the dollar is moving higher, that interest rates are moving lower, that financial conditions are tightening. And so the labor force participation rate, when we look at this slide, let's go back to it. What is it telling you? Well, the Fed wants it to go up, but it's, it's, it's struggling to. And why is that? Because financial, when financial conditions are tight, well, that means money is tight. And when money is tight, well, consumption starts to drop. And when consumption falls, well, what do you think happens to labor force participation rate? It goes down because people start losing their job. So the Fed, again, sees no issue with demand. And I look at the story and see it entirely as a demand issue. But now let's take a look at the wage story, because here you see hours hourly earnings are running at 4.8%. They're higher than they typically usually are. And the Fed's concerned that because of the tight labor market, this is going to go higher. And what happens if we to inflation. What do you think is going to happen to inflation if wages go up? Ah, now we're getting to the real root of the story here is the Fed believes that when average hourly earnings rise, that somehow, as you can see here, inflation, well, went down. Uh, you can see that when, inf when average hourly earnings tend to rise, that inflation, okay, well, it went down there. And when it rises, well, kind of, it kind of fell down there. Okay, here, when it, right, yeah, okay, when it rises, it falls. So for some reason, the Fed thinks that when average hourly earnings rise, that what's going to happen is inflation is going to go up. And if you have a supply chain problem and demand gets bigger, what happens to the inflation problem? It gets worse. So what do they need to do? If you're, if you're the Fed and that's your view, what do you need to do? You need to accelerate your tapering down to zero so you can get in a position by mid next year in 2022 to raise rates. And what did we talk about on Wednesday? What does that mean? Well, if the Fed accelerates all, we already know when the Fed does normal tapering, it tightens financial conditions. We're seeing that in the market now. Things are getting volatile. It's likely to lead to a sell-off. And again, that is the whole issue here is the Fed could push us back into recession because the market is telling us the financial conditions are tight. And that is the problem. Now, if you have a portfolio, check out Portfolio because if you're not protected against a downturn, check it out. I invented it. I manage it. It's really cool. You take your time to take a look at it because if you're concerned about downside risk, well, that, that'll probably help you out quite a bit completely different than anything you've seen on the market. Now, let's go on with the Fed story because you see this total non-farm job openings, they're at over 10 million. So you, you get the whole story here. The Fed's saying, look, there's, there's 10 million people unemployed, there's all this demand, and there's a shortage of supply, there's a tight labor market, wages are gonna go up, this inflation thing's gonna get out of control, we've gotta stop it, and in turn, what they're gonna do is crash the whole thing. But even the Fed itself, the New York Fed, their own people, their staff economists, they think the Fed, they think the FOMC is wrong. They, they think there's a problem. Now, now the next slides we're going to go through, we're going to get a little deep into the data. There's like three, maybe four slides. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of heavy. So I'm going to prepare you for this now, but just stick with me because the conclusions are going to blow you away. I'll, I'm going to simplify it all out, but I've got to share it with you. All right, so let's check this out. We're going to go to Liberty Street Economics. This is the research desk of the New York Fed. The term spread as a predictor of financial instability. All right, what is this thing? The term spread is the difference between interest rates on short and long dated government securities. All right, remember what I started the show about? Talking about short rates going up, long rates going down. Keep, keep that in your mind. It's good. Like I said, it's going to totally blow you away. 
okay, is often referred to as a predictor of the business cycle. In particular, inversions of the yield curve and negative term spread are considered an early warning sign. Such inversions typically receive a lot of attention in policy debates when they occur. In this post, we'll point to another property of the term spread, namely its predictive ability for financial crisis events, both internationally and in the historical U.S. data. So we're going to study the predictive power of the term spread for financial stability events in the United States over the past 150 years. Now, we're not going to go through all of that, but I want you to just kind of see what this is, the behavior of the term spread around the crisis. Because I, before I show you the chart, you have to understand what I'm showing you. So what they do is for the United States specifically, these are the three month treasury bill and 10 year treasury bond rates. So that's what they're looking at. Now we'll go forward here. It's clear that the term spread is significantly lower, keep that in mind, lower in the years before a financial crisis, both in the international sample and the US case. When all countries are considered, the term spread is approximately one percentage point lower on average in the two years before, excuse two years before an onset of a crisis. For the United States specifically, this effect is almost doubled the year before an onset, reaching two percentage points lower than usual on average. And so for a concrete example, the run-up of 2007 and 8, which we'll look at in financial crisis in the U.S., long-term rates decline. Keep in mind what's happened today, despite increasingly tight monetary policy. Now, again, you know, Right now, monetary policy is tight and they're going to tighten it even more. I mean, I know it's strange that we're easing and that it's actually tight, but that's my whole point is monetary policy is tight and they're going to make it tighter. It's, it just, it's crazy when you see this. Giving a rise to Alan Greenspan's famous description of the development as a conundrum. As a result, the term spread fell by three percentage points at the time. Similarly, though, not as widely discussed contemporary, the term spread declined a total of 3.3 points in the United States between 1924 and 28, and the lead up to the 1929 crash and Great Depression. In the run up to normal recessions, however, we observe only limited movement. So in conclusion, before we get to the, you know, the summary, I'm going to make this really nice for you. The term spread is often used as an early warning indicator for recessions. We showed it performs well as a predictor of financial crises, both internationally and in the U.S. alone. There is a significant benefit to including the term spread as a predictor for two separate crisis definitions. And so now let, we identified that this effect is driven by the short end of the yield curve rising, key, 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 and offered a potential explanation based on higher risk taking by financial intermediaries in a time before a crisis okay now let's i'm gonna blow you away because we predicted this on this show now if you watch the show for a long time you'll remember this but check this out do you remember when we talked about the standing repurchase agreements that the fed rolled out back in July of this year, announced the establishment of two standing repurchase facilities, a domestic and a foreign one. And do you remember, do you remember what I said they were going to, what the intended purpose was to drive short-term rates up, that's why we're in the crown, and do what long-term rates down. Other reason we're wearing the crown. So I said back then that this was going to happen. Now let's check out the chart because again, this blows you away. Here it is. You can do this on the FRED database yourself. I took the market yield to 10 years constant maturity minus the three month. And what do you see? You get an inversion and then it rises, goes into a recession. Inversion rises into a recession. Inversion rises into a recession. And then as we get into the 90s, we get that kind of lead going into the recession as that, that article talked about is it gets near an inversion and then rises into a recession. Inversion, rising into recession, inversion, rising into recession, inversion, rising into recession, which the New York Fed economics team says happen, it happens near the 2% level. And here we are somewhere over one and a half. There it is. Now you can see it. And all that we knew was going to happen. And again, that's why I kind of mentioned, you know, if, you, if, if you're investing in the market, check out Portfolio Show because this is you know, going to be a risk off event. The only question we don't know is how big the downturn is and if your portfolio can handle it. So, but it's, it's getting worse because we got the ISM data today. And what did the ISM services tell us? Oh yeah, there, there's a problem. You know, there's, there's demand in the services sector. So again, the Fed's looking at all this data and saying, wow, you know, we've got a problem on the supply side. We've got to contain inflation. Again, what are they going to do? They're going to try to control supply side inflation with monetary policy. Do you know what monetary policy was not designed to do? Fix supply chain issues. And that's how you know they're gonna crash everything. The only thing we don't know is how big the crash is gonna be. 
because monetary policy, my friends, is designed to fix money printing issues, you, which we can't do. But if we were printing money, then you would tighten financial conditions, soak that money up, and you fix your problem. If you have a supply chain issue, someone please tell me how raising rates or tightening financial conditions gets goods off of ships faster. It doesn't. So here you can see in the ISM, the November services was up to 69.1. Usually it's great. Normally this is what you want. And what happened? Services PMI up, business activity up from the month before, new orders up from the month before, employment up, inventories up, prices up, backlog of orders up, export orders up, inventory sentiment. Everything's better. I mean, our inventory sentiment, is, it went down because they want more inventory. So everything here tells the Fed, hey, look, the you know, supply problem, demand is there. Demand is there. And that's how you know this whole thing's going to blow apart. Again, we just don't know how big. Now, for my longtime fans that said, how come we haven't gone through the H.8? All right, let's do it. All right, here's the H.8 from today. Bank credit expanding. But want you to notice, what are the banks buying? Well, they happen to buy 17 billion of non-mortgage-backed securities, or what's also known as U.S. Treasuries. So now they went from buying a bunch of mortgage-backed securities. Remember, they were buying those like crazy. Well, now they're buying Treasuries, and you wonder why interest rates are going down. Loans and leases are up. Uh, commercial industrial loans up. Real estate loans up. Everything here is looking up. We even have consumer loans up. Uh, all other loans and leases, including margin debt up and cash assets are down a little bit, but still trending higher. Remember when banks buy, when, when consumer deposits come into the banks, what do they have to do? Buy more treasury securities. All right. So with that, as always, appreciate all of you for being fans. Thanks for watching. I am going to work on that special uh, video about how the QE thing works. Uh, hopefully we'll get that done pretty soon so you can watch that. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you back on Sunday if you're watching the chart show because it's a lot of interesting things going on in the charts. Of course, we'll be back on Monday for the regular show. I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Bye now. The content of this video is provided as educational information is not intended by investor or advice. This video is not to be construed as a recognition or solicitation of buyer selling securities for actually isn't or to participate in any particular trading strategy. This video was prepared by Steve Van Meter. Personal capacity, please express this video that I do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advisors, Inc. or Steve Van Meter Financial.